Hello everybody and welcome to the um, monthly NHSR webinar for the NHSR community. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm your host. I'm, I kind of help with the community and it's great to have uh, uh, all of you uh, join us for this uh, one hour webinar um, for our colleagues from Scotland who I'll, I'll actually ask them to introduce themselves in a minute. But I'll just for those of you that are new to the NHSR community, uh, just a quick sense really that the NHSR community is open for everyone. Uh, we're we're uh, very warm and welcoming and friendly to, to all sorts of uh, levels of uh, expertise in terms of uh, R and other open source solutions. Um, we have a virtual academy and the academy offers training and webinars and, and conference. Um, and we also uh, look for people who've got um, uh, real life solution uh, problems that they're trying to solve. And I think the presentation today will be really uh, useful from that point of view. So uh, we fund small projects, but anybody who's got ideas for things where we should work together to try and develop solutions would also are, are welcome to kind of contact us. Um, ways of getting in touch through through uh, our website, through um, Slack is where we do most of our work, the NHSR Slack community. Um, but you can tweet us also and we have book clubs and podcasts and so many other things going on. Uh, and for um, for those of you who don't know, we partner with Hexitime, which is a, a free platform uh, where, where people can, uh, not, it's not just data science, it's actually the wider network of health and care professionals. And you can always kind of have some fun on Hexitime as well. Um, and just before I, I hand over to our presenters, um, just to give you a sense, we've got um, a, a month, uh, uh, this is our kind of itinerary for the next few uh, the next few months, uh, a webinar for the 20th of, Ju 20th of July, still to be confirmed by the way, um, but then we have we try and have one every month um, and there's some uh, interactive workshops uh, for uh, for plotting and introduction to R and shiny on the dates as you can see here. I know these they do get full quite quickly, but so be patient, but also if you see them advertised then kind of try and jump on the bus as soon as you can. And the big event for November is our annual conference 16th and 17th of November. Um, and it'll be a hybrid event so people can come in person but also join uh, join remotely. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our colleagues from Scotland. It's always a pleasure to have uh, speakers from all across the country and internationally also join our webinars. And I'll hand over to Scott to kind of uh, do some introductions and then he'll ha he'll take over the, 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 uh, the, the mic from me. Over to Scott, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mohammed, and um, welcome everybody along today. Um, great to see um, everybody here today. Um, and as yes, Mohammed says, we are from Public Health Scotland. Um, we hope that you enjoy your session today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen at the moment and just bear with me. Okay, duck. Okay, yeah, so we are from Public Health Scotland. We are within the statistical governance um, and Chile team. So Chile stands for CHI, uh, CHI linkage, CHI being the, the Scottish version of the NHS number. Um, so, so we're two functions basically within one sort of one sort of team. Um, Robert and Alex, who are presenting uh, later on today, um, are, are within the Chile function, um, though are particularly good when it comes to R, so are helping out the, the, the governance side in terms of our statistical disclosure control. Uh, so this is quite an interesting project for us. We've been running it now for three or four months. Um, the original idea was that we would have a little bit of code to help our analysts um, do some disclosure control. Um, that then morphed over time into um, a sort of bigger project and now we have just user tested our, our app which is uh, the result of it and we're hoping to roll this out across the uh, across Public Health Scotland over the next little while and I'm sure this could be made available um, to others as well. Uh, so just a little bit on Public Health Scotland. Um, it's a fairly new organisation in that um, the organisation came together um, as part of a merger um, in April 2020, just, just as COVID was hitting. Um, so that was a, a merger between ISD Scotland, that's Information Services Division, which is um, the body that looked after all NHS data, uh, along with Health Protection Scotland and NHS Health Scotland. So it's it's a fairly new organisation um, in that sense. And obviously it's, we've been heavily involved in, in COVID work over the last a couple of years, um, which has been handy in one respect because um, people have really got to know what Public Health Scotland do. Um, certainly in Scotland, people are used to hearing that. They, they, they see the figures on the news very much so. Um, as, as bad as COVID was, of course, um, there was a sort of underlying good marketing strategy um, for our organisation at that point. Um, you can see on the screen there some of our uh, values. Um, 
but one thing I wanted to point out is that as part of our um, digital transformation strategy, we are very much as an organisation moving completely towards um, R um, as our main analytical tool. So um, we use various different packages at the moment, um, but these things are, are tend to get sort of phased out a little bit and R is going to be a huge for the organisation. Um, it already is huge, but it's going to even just, just get bigger and bigger. Um, we, we, we're looking to get our own servers. Um, and it's, it's there's a big sort of training programme at the moment just now, so we're hoping to, to link into the NHSR community um, as we do so. Across Public Health Scotland, we produce a lot of, of information across the year. So we've got management information publications and um, we had 213 in, in the last financial year. Most of them were COVID based. Um, so the, the number looks high there, but a lot of these are weekly publications. Um, we also have 100, 195 official statistics publications um, and 87 national statistic publications, which have been audited by uh, the OSR. Um, so that's around about 600 or so uh, publications across the year. That number's going up and up and up, um, and there's lots and lots of work that's uh, that's going on um, across all aspects of, of health data. So not just COVID, obviously, but we've got lots and lots of, of different stuff um, within those numbers. We also have a huge open data set, um, which is also growing. So um, as of March, we had 729 open data sets available on our open data platform. So that's basically um, all the raw data um, that we use. People can go in, take a copy of it and do their own analysis or, or, or use it however they wish to. Um, that's a really good resource for us in terms of um, allowing people to see the what the data looks like. It's, it's we're very open and transparent when it comes to this sort of stuff, um, and it, it's very well used. There you'll see there. There's one. There was 1.7 uh, page, 1.7 million page views um, in that financial year as well. So it's it's an excellent resource. And, and if you if you are ever looking for Public Health Scotland data, please just search Open Data, um, and you'll 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 find the platform, and it's all in there um, for use. Um, most of our publications are currently in PDF form. We are moving that over towards HTML um, and we're trying to sort of phase out as well, um, big sort of Excel books. Um, so we're looking to do more sort of interactive charts, um, more open data um, and just, just try and make our data a little bit more uh, user friendly um, and, and just to provide a little bit more uh, sort of value to people who are using it. And as I say, we're very big in R. Um, we're, We've developed lots and lots of R shiny dashboards. Um, we've also got some Tableau dashboards, um, though R, R is certainly our sort of main one. So that was just a sort of quick overview of Public Health Scotland. Um, we're, here to, we're here today to talk about statistical disclosure control, which comes under the this is the statistical governance bracket. Um, so what we will do um, at, for the first 15 minutes or so, we'll go through some of the theory behind disclosure so people will get an understanding of, of, of what we mean by it. Um, we will have a look at our um, statistical disclosure control flowchart to show how we think about the risks and, and make some decisions around how, how we um, use our data in, in a safe way. We will touch a little bit on the risk management of that and then I'll hand over to Robert and Alex who will demonstrate their um, disclosure control app which is all done through our shiny is looking really really good and hopefully it'll, it will save lots of time for, for analysts who are who are at the moment doing disclosure control in a very sort of manual way um, this will automate that process um, and you'll have all the benefits of of that along with things like um, reduction of any sort of human error so so the app's looking really good um, and, and we'll show you that just shortly so what do we mean by um, statistical disclosure control so this is when we are using some techniques to try and prevent any confidential or or, or sensitive or private data being uh, released into uh, into the public so we can use a few different methods to make sure that any data about a specific person um, on, an, on an individual basis or even a group of people or an organization um, if there's anything that we think that looks a bit risky that we wouldn't necessarily want our own data to be uh, to be available um, we would be looking to put in some sort of control so it's, it's ultimately about suppressing some numbers where where possible and um, those there's different techniques to do so we do need to have a think about risk management on that um, because we want to make sure that our data is, is safe but at the same time we also want, we want to make sure that it's usable there's no point in this um, suppressing all, all, all low numbers, otherwise um, 
it, 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 you just lose any sort of value and any use for it. So we've got to find the balance between risk and, and usage. Um, now in Public Health Scotland, we have four main disclosure control techniques. There are lots and lots of techniques out there, um, but these are our four preferred ones. So we use table redesign um, as one of our preferred um, methods. The table redesign we haven't included in the disclosure control app just because it is so unique to, to each data set. However, cell suppression, rounding and swapping, we'll go through those quickly in a second. These are all built into the app um, and is now available for for analysts to be able to just press a few buttons and any of these techniques will will happen um, with the exclusion of, of table redesign. So what, what do I mean? I'm just going to give you a quick example of, of types of data that we're looking at here. So um, let's imagine we've got this table here. So it's it's sensitive data and um, we've got sensitive A, B and C. It's broken down by quite small age bands. So you've got 20 to 24 and so on. And you'll see in there that we've got a, a series of quite low numbers. So we would be thinking at this point, well, um, this is also a small population, as we can see from the head, head of there. So if you look at that column, uh, 24 to 20, 20 to 24, uh, sensitive B, there's only one person in there. So it could be something like a, a 22 year old who has um, who has suicidal ideation, for instance. So that's a sensitive topic. Now. We would be interested to hide some of these low numbers in the event that somebody is able to either identify themselves within that data set or somebody is able to identify another person and then potentially use that data in a sort of negative way. So we've got some different techniques, as I was saying. Table redesign is the first one. The easiest way to redesign this table uh, would be just to expand those age groups. So um, your 20 to 24 becomes 20 to 29. Now that, on this occasion, still does give you small small numbers, um, seven and six. And at that point, you'd have to make a decision about whether that's safe enough or whether you're OK just to release. So that's what we mean by table redesign. You'll see it a lot in Scotland, um, particularly where we are working with health board data um, and there's data coming in from NHS Orkney, NHS Shetland, very small populations. They tend to have low numbers when we do counts. So a lot of the time we'll, we'll sort of merge them together and call them the NHS island boards along with the Western Isles. Um, so that's a kind of table redesign that we would be looking at. But you can do it with anything. You can do it with, with AGs or, or, or whatever um, your variables are in your data set. Of uh, cell suppression, so again, using the same data set, um, cell suppression is basically just a case of, of, of hiding um, some of your low numbers or, or, or whatever numbers you think are, are a risk. And we would do that using a small C. So your five, your one within the 2024 20, column just become a C. It's confidential and we're not going to give you that data out. So that it's got positives in it. It's one of our preferred methods. Um, it, it gives you quite good protection for, for small numbers, particularly for, for, for zeros as well. So we would also um, normally we would we would suppress zeros depending on what the data is, um, and it also allows your, your structure to uh, to remain the same. So you don't have to redesign tables. Um, you, you, it, it looks pretty much the same as as the uncontrolled stuff, albeit with your numbers protected. Um, negatives of self-suppression is that you do lose some information, of course, so, so nobody's able to know um, which numbers are behind those C's. So, so there is a bit of an information loss there. Um, and when you bring in secondary suppression, so th th there's not an example of secondary suppression on that screen there, but um, there are there are negatives in that because secondary suppression is when you're suppressing the next lowest number. So it could be that the case that the next lowest number is, is is a safe number, but you've had to suppress it because you can work it out from totals. Um, so cell suppression is one of our preferred options and built into the app that the, the guys will show you uh, just shortly. We also have rounding, um, so we, we can round to any base, which we tend to base um, we tend to round to base five or three in Public Health Scotland, but you can use any number. So that basically just takes all your numbers. Um, so for, in this occasion, any number that's a zero, one, two, or three goes to zero. Anything that's a four, four, five, six, or seven would go to a five, and anything that's eight, nine, or ten would go to ten. Um, so again, there are positives and negatives of of, of, of all of these uh, methods. So some of the positives would be that you can you can keep your additivity, or you can hide your additivity. So you've you've got a bit of a um, a choice to make there about, about what you want to do with your with your totals. Um, again, you don't need to redesign your table to do this. Um, the problems can come along though when 
it doesn't necessarily look like your data has been controlled for. So you need to be very clear that uh, you have controlled this data and that these figures uh, are not the actual real ones. Um, and then you also get into a little bit of difficulties with rounding when you're trying to re uh, revise data. So it's quite hard to unpick it, even if you've got the original stuff. If, say for instance, you've made a mistake and you need to sort of update it. You can get into a little bit of difficulty with rounding, but that's kind of similar for, uh, for all the control methods. And then finally, cell swapping. So this is literally as just moving the numbers around. Um, so you'll see that in the, in the top row in sensitive A, the three, five and nine have been changed. Um, again, that potentially has some downfalls in that it doesn't necessarily look like you've done any control method um, um, to this one. So again, it's, it's about being clear that there has been a, a disclosure um, method being applied. Um, but again, it's, it's good for your totals, if you want to keep your totals uh, uh, the same. Um, it also means that subtraction attacks can't really happen because you're not sure which ones are which. So there's, pro there's pros and cons of all these, um, but certainly these are our four main ones and the, and cell swapping round and, and suppression are all built into to our app. So on um, disclosure control, as I was saying, we need to find the balance between being safe and being useful. So we don't want to overprotect things. We don't want to say that every low number needs to be controlled in some way. Otherwise, what's the point in doing it really? Um, but we also want to make sure that we're protecting people um, or organisations. So you're always trying to find that balance between between being um, too risky and uh, and being too safe sort of thing. Um, it's, it's difficult to completely con uh, control your risks and, and to put 100% or it's, it's difficult to, to make sure that your data is always going to be protected. Um, there are times when you just have to accept the risk, depending on what it is, um, and that's just the nature of it. So you're, you're constantly thinking about how to risk assess um, potentially risky cells. We use our flowchart, I'll show you that in a second, um, to, to show you how we make some of these decisions. Um, and then as I say, we've got a risk assessment form, uh, which is internal and um, we would always complete a risk assessment form whenever we were sending some data out to make sure that people know that we've, we've considered disclosure control as being um, as being a risk and what we've done about it. So in Public Health Scotland, we have um, our flowchart. So this is on two pages. I've had to put it on two so that you can see it. Um, so the first part of it is, um, would any of these conditions apply? So say you've got a data set, you're not sure whether you need to apply um, a control measure or not. So we would ask a few questions. Um, and we would start off with, with sort of simple um, questions like, do you have counts from one to nine? So if, 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 if you've got data that's all large numbers, all above nine, then you're probably OK just to release. Um, but if you do have some small numbers, then we need to do a little bit of investigation to see what those are. Similarly, if your columns are uh, denominated by all zeros or by 100 percent, and there's potential in there for a, a sort of subtraction attack, again, we would be thinking about what do we need to do here to make sure that this data remains safe. We would also be looking at um, what size the population is. So if we were looking to send out data about NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, for instance, it's a huge population. It's 1.1 million people. Um, chances are that you're going to have you're going to struggle to identify an individual person um, unless it's perhaps yourself. But we would perhaps be a bit more cautious for um, any of the smaller boards, so NHS borders or any of the island boards where the numbers are much smaller and people tend to know each other um, depending on what community you're in. Um, and then similarly, as you, as you go down from move away from health boards, if you're looking at individual GP practices or clinics, how many people are potentially within that data set and can people be, be identified? So that would probably then is towards making a decision around whether to apply a control measure. And then we would also look at what data is actually being uh, sent out, what data has been included. So does it have personal data? Does it have sensitive data? Um, does it talk about people's uh, demographics, their age, the postcode, the sexual orientation, their ethnicity? Um, is there data in there about vulnerable people, for instance? So we would take all this into consideration as to whether to uh, uh, apply a control measure or not. So the next part of that, so any of those questions above, should you answer yes, we would be asking our teams to complete our risk assessment form. Um, if, the risk, if the risk assessment form comes out with a high score, then we would ask you to protect the data. So go and do a, a suppression or redesign or do something to make sure that, that it's safe. Um, if the score's a bit lower, we would then look at 
um, how sensitive the topic is. Um, is, it, is it a topic that we don't really need to worry too much about, in which case we can then make the decision about just releasing it or protecting it. Um, and we've got sort of various ways of doing that. We, we, we'll, ask, we'll ask some questions. So we'll look at it from a, a sort of standard risk assessment uh, process. We would look at the likelihood of an attempt to disclose. Uh, we would look at the impact of disclosure. So we would ask questions like, who wants the data? What do they want it for? What are they going to do with it? Who, who's going to have access to it? Um, is it data that's that's been requested from an unknown person? So you don't know the answer to any of that, which in which case you might think, okay, we need to be a little bit cautious. Or is it somebody from a CEO from a health board, for instance, who's wanting to use it for some planning purposes? And at, at that point, you'd probably be a bit less uh, inclined to, to apply a control measure, depending on what, what level of risk you think you've got in there. We would look at sensitive topics. So on the right hand side there, some of the sensitive topics include things like um, STDs, uh, abortion, self-harm, suicide, uh, mental health, drug and alcohol misuse, um, contraception and vulnerable populations like looked after kids or adult protection or, or whatever it might be. That's not an exhaustive list and we always say to um, our analytical colleagues that you know your data best. So you decide whether you think it's sensitive you decide the circumstances of it and, and you decide whether you are applying some sort of control me uh, measure or not. Um, so I suppose what I'm trying to say here is statistical disclosure control was a really sort of grey area. It's not black and white. It's not it's not a science. It's more of an art. Um, decisions can be very different depending on, on who you speak to. So you, the processes that we've got in place are hopefully um, able to lead us all down the sort of same path, but it's always up for debate. It's a really tricky topic um, and it comes up often, certainly in Public Health Scotland and I'm sure in various other organisations. Um, and just on, our, on, our, on other organisations, everybody's got their own disclosure control policy. There's not a sort of national one of any... of any. Uh, it, it's all sort of based on what your own organisation thinks. So just because we do something doesn't necessarily mean and the next organisation does it the same. However, the control method, the control measures are all the same and the app should be able to be uh, transferable across organisations in, in, in that respect. Um, and yeah, this slide is just looking at, at that balance between how much you protect against the utility of the data and you've got to make sure you've got that balance, otherwise you're going to end up protecting far too much or not enough and that makes your data really good in terms of its usage but potentially risky um, or if it's overprotected, then it's, it's kind of unusable data, in which case we wouldn't necessarily want to um, send that out. So that's just a quick overview of statistical disclosure control. Um, a big subject, we could talk for a long time about, about that, and it's 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 ingrained in lots of stuff that we do, um, particularly when we're publishing data. Um, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Robert Scott, and Alex. Scott, that's great. Can, just before you hand over, can I just ask, I think people will be interested in knowing kind of how long it took to develop the conceptual framework uh, that kind of underpins the uh, the data science solution here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the organisation has been using disclosure control for, for a long, long time. Um, however, probably about, around about this time last year, uh, one of our heads of service asked if we could uh, create some sort of, at that, at that point it was a bit of code. So, um, we didn't put that into place until probably we started talking to Alex and Robert about it, maybe around about November, December time. Mm. Um, and then the code was fairly quick to put in place for most of it. Uh, I'm sure Alex and Robert will, will, will talk about that in a second. Um, but by the time this sort of morphed into what we're about to show you now in the app, we're probably talking around about three months or so from from let's do something to to, to hear it is three months, maybe, maybe a little bit more, maybe four months. But, but yes, yeah, so, it's certainly within three or four months. Thanks, Scott. I'll let, I'll let you carry on. Do you want to hand over to Alex now, did you? Say? Yeah, I'll, I'll bring Alex in now and Alex will talk a little bit around some of the background of the app and then we'll hand over to Robert after that. Uh, hello, uh, just uh, just a little bit. The reason why we've chose the Shiny app is, uh, as Scott mentioned, uh, disclosure control is a bit of a grey area. So we wanted people maybe they don't have a lot of knowledge in it that they can, that can have a tool that can make them quite competent to make decisions and to see these decisions when they do their disclosure control. And also on the other hand, maybe not have the R skills quite quite yet to, to implement it. So we wanted to come up with something that can aid kind of 
both groups to try and produce a, a, a quality analytical output for themselves. So that's why we went for a shiny app. Uh, the app that we've designed, it's it's to be integrated within the kind of data data processing cycle for a publication, either a file or an actual uh, for data tables that then support a publication. Uh, so it's probably more suited for that new new existing and established data processes rather than something that's already established and has got its data process that's that's used yearly or monthly or quarterly depending on the, the, the life cycle for it. So with that, uh, our, uh, the app, um, it, dis it, discloses, it discloses of controls whole numbers rather than metrics and proportions of groups. So the app, as you'll see when Robert gives the demonstration, has uh, functions that allow you to remove and re-add metrics such as averages and percentages, which are not disclosed, uh, and then allows you to do the disclosure stuff and then add them back in to then, then continue on. So if you're looking at things where you've got whole numbers, but you also have percentages for these groups of whole numbers, that would be something that would be done after the app uh, and then you'd do something where you'd have a control statement in your own code. But if it's been disclosed, then you would disclose it. If not, you would calculate the percentage as normal. So that's how that the app is kind of positioned and designed around to fit into that kind of process. So I'll just hand over now to Robert and he can then talk you through a couple of examples of using it for different uh, techniques. Uh, thanks, Alex. So I'm now going to share my screen just now, which uh, has the app so everyone can see it. So for the app itself, it's currently set up as a standalone website. So the main advantage of doing it like this is that this doesn't require any code to be inputted for any form of disclosure. So the first section here, which is the home tab, gives you an idea of how to use all the features of the app. So SDC app instructions tells you what step to do each feature in. So you have steps one to five here. So uploading the file, filtering and formatting, then do your disclosure, then re-adding any filter data or reformatting the data, and then finally the download data stage. The next section in the home tabs, SDC theory. So it gives some uh, general information as well as pros and cons on all three methods used in the app. So it gives information on rounding, record swapping and suppression. And if I go down a bit further, there's also some information on table redesign. I mean, this isn't available with the app, as was mentioned earlier, but this can be used to assist with uh, uh, guidance on how to use the app and just to let the user know that table redesign uh, isn't available. And this is a method to be done uh, manually before your data is entered into the app. So for the next stage, this is the file input stage. So this is where we upload the file. So just before I upload the file, I want to mention that this app isn't restricted to one file type. So this can be used to upload both CSV and XLSX files. So to upload your file, you just need to click the browse button here. And once you click the browse button, you go to the folder of your choice, which I'm already in, and then you click the file that you want to work on. Once you do this, you should see upload complete to let you know that it's been uh, uploaded. And then you should see uh, two tables appear in this section. So they both give uh, information with regards to the file input. So the data summary table gives some information for each variable in the app. And while the percentage of missing data table gives how much data is missing for each variable in the app, uh, the second table is used primarily for data quality. Another section in this app here is data summary after processing. So this represents the data that's now in the app. So it's a very similar table to the file inputs. The only difference really here at the moment is there's a variable called serial. I mean, this is something that's added by the app itself, so it can assist with the purposes of filtering. And also like throughout the process, like when the features have used these tables in this section, percentage of missing data and data summary will change. Uh, this is used primarily to so that you know that the data is formatted in the way you expect. The next section here is filtering and transform format. 
So, I mean, I'm going to be uploading a different file uh, later on during the demo to demonstrate these features. And I'm going to firstly demonstrate the three methods, rounding, record swapping and primary suppression. So for rounding, it's fairly simple to do. You select all the numeric variables that you want to round. And then once you've done that, you then select what you want to round it to in the condition for rounding box. So it's a default value of 10. And in this case, I'm going to set it to five. So all numeric variables I've selected will be rounded to the nearest five. So if I go along here very quickly, you can see what it looks like currently. And uh, once I go back and press rounding, it will then uh, round your data. I also want to point out very quickly the notifications that appear. So they are used to give assurance to the user that the app is working as expected. So if it's working successfully, you should see a notification with a green tick. And if something's not working as expected, you should see a notification with a red cross. So I'll just demonstrate something that doesn't work as expected. So I'm going to click the round button without selecting uh, any variables. And as I'd expect, though it doesn't really uh, work and it tells you why, so it says there's no input variables selected, so please select. Now I'm going to go to tab five here very quickly, download data. So this is where you download the final file. However, here I'm not I'm using this to reset the data back to its initial state. Uh, the reason that I'm doing this here is so I can demonstrate the other two methods. And th this button here is primarily used so so in case any mistakes have been made during the process. So if you've made any mistakes with any of the features, it will reset the data back to its initial state. So I'll just click uh, reset data and then the data is reset back to what it was when it was uploaded. So for the second method, uh, record swapping, the process here is very similar to rounding. You select all numeric variables you want to work on. And then you select the condition for swapping. So I'm going to select a value of five here. So what this will do is for all of the columns in this data set, any value that's less than or equal to five will be swapped around in the columns and any value that's above that will stay in the same position. So I'll just click that just now and you should be able to see here that the lower values are in different positions to what they were previously. I'm now going to move on to the suppression section to demonstrate primary suppression. So the setup for primary suppression is very similar to rounding and record swapping. You select all variables you want to perform primary suppression on. And then you select condition for suppression. In this case, I'm putting in a value of four. So what this will do is for all values less than or equal to four in the selected variables, they will all be suppressed and all higher values will remain as they are. So if I go along here very quickly and I click the suppression button under primary suppression, you'll now be able to see that all the lower values, those that are below four are suppressed and all higher values remain unsuppressed. Now for the primary secondary suppression, I'm going to upload a different data set to demonstrate that. So I go back to file input, uh, back to browse, and then I'm going to upload a new file here. So th th this file upload will be the same as it is before. It'll say upload complete though once that's been done, and then these tables will be uh, repopulated with the new variables. So even though this is a larger data set than previously, this will upload relatively quickly. And now that the data is uploaded, I'm going to demonstrate the filtering functions of the app. So to perform filtering, you firstly click this button, store on process data. This will store the data prior to filtering. I then click the add filter button. And once you do that, you should see two uh, select boxes as well as a clear filter button. So for a uh, filter, I firstly select a variable I want to filter. In this case, this is called type of measurement. I then select the values I want to remove. In this case, I'm removing all values bar weight distribution number. And for that variable, the reason that I'm doing this is because these values here link to the value column and every other t observation and type of measure apart from weight distribution number represent metrics such as uh, percentages and means. So just before I uh, remove the values, I just want to 
go down here, which shows you the number of entries. So at the moment, 30,278. And if filtering has occurred successfully, you should expect to see that number reduce. So I'm now going to select all values that I want to remove. And as you can see, though, in the entries, it's now 5,396 entries. So filtering has now occurred successfully. And I go to the clear filter button. Once you've done any sort of filtering, you should always click this button. Otherwise, it can cause uh, some complications with trying to re-add the data back in at a later stage. Once I've done that, I click store filter data. This stores the data so it can be re-added later. And now I go to the transform format stage. Now this stage is used to transform a long data format into a wide data format. Uh, the reason that I'm going to do this here is so that I can perform primary and secondary suppression. Uh, the format that it, that it is in currently is in a format where you can you, you're unable to do so. So just you can see what it looks like at the moment. I uh, firstly remove the serial number so that this transformation can occur successfully. I then select the key variable, which in this case is wait and time. The value variable in this case is value. And then I click this button here, transform long to wide. If what this will do is you can now see the wait and time column has disappeared. And if I scroll along here, the unique observations from wait and time have now become column headers representing the value column. And if you have a look at these four variables at the end, you can see that if you sum all four of them together, they sum to this value total patient seen. So because we've now got a sum representing the total, this now allows us to perform primary and secondary suppression. So for primary secondary suppression, go back to tab four in the suppression section. You firstly choose your variables for primary suppression. So in this case, that's the total variable, total patient seen. You then select the variables for secondary suppression. In this case, that's all the values that sum to this total, so all four variables ending in weeks. I'm going to keep the suppression condition as four. And just before I do that, I'm going to tick the, this box here. Hmm. Apologies, I just had a slight technical issue, so I'll have to uh, re upload the data. However, this won't take long. This will be the same process as it, as it was when it, what I showed you. We are having a few issues today with MR and various things and within the organisation, so that's why that happens. It's typical that it's today, but there yeah. it is. It's, 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 sorry, Robert, just while it's uploading, just uh, uh, when do you plan to go live with the tool? All right, so at the moment it's uh, set up as a uh, standalone website, so in terms of uh, rolling it out to the whole organisation, no, that shouldn't be uh, too long now, though. I mean, I would suspect those Scott would probably be able to answer this better than me, but I suspect it would probably be in a matter of weeks. All right, great. Yeah, I think it's pretty much ready. We've just finished a, a, a round of user testing. Um, we've fixed a few bugs and issues that, that came up through that. Um, so we just need to make a decision about whether to do any more user testing or whether we are comfortable enough just to roll it out. But yeah, it's 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 imminent really. I think it's it can it can be moved out um, just whenever, just like within the next couple of weeks, as Robert says. Right. Robert, carry on with your demo, by the way. That's yeah, great. Thank yeah. you. I'm just doing the same processes as I did earlier, just to get back to the primary and secondary suppression stage. I should also say that um, all the data that we're using today either has been published, um, so it doesn't need to be con uh, controlled in any way. Um, and the previous data that Robert had up there was um, eating disorders in children, which was published by NHS Digital, um, they didn't control uh, for um, any disclosure risks. Um, though what, what we have done is we've already swapped that data so that it wasn't identifiable um, by accident. Okay, so I'm just going to do a primary secondary suppression now. So I've selected the same variables as I have before, same conditions. Now, just before I'm do, I do that, I'm going to tick this box here, no zero suppression. So if you have a look at the, these values here, the zeros in here, the zeros should remain unsuppressed once I press uh, the suppress button. This is a case for both primary and secondary suppression. 
So as to how primary and secondary suppression will work, firstly, primary suppression performed in the total patient seen. So that puts the same as before, suppresses all values less than or equal to four. For the values selected for secondary suppression, it'll suppress all values less than or equal to four initially. And then if there is a, just one suppression within a particular row, it will then suppress the next lowest value. So this will ensure that for each row, there is always more than one suppression. So I, I'll now click primary and secondary. So once primary and secondary has been clicked, if I scroll along here, you'll now be able to see that the zeros uh, remain unsuppressed and the lower values uh, all have C's in them, as well as the fact that there is always more than one C for each row. And I'm just going to rearrange the total patient's teen data set just so you can see variable, just so you can see that uh, primary and secondary suppression has been performed. And now that uh, that's been performed, I'm going to go back to tab three. This is so I can put the data back into a similar format to the input. Well, a similar format as possible so, so that it's a, so that for uh, uploading, because we don't want the data to look uh, too different barring the changes that have been made via disclosure. So firstly, we transform the data back again. We don't need to select any buttons. And as you can see, the waiting time variables back in, and you can see the value variables back as well. We now re add the serial number, and the reason that we do this is so we can re add the filter data. This should ensure that the data itself is organized in the same way it was before, so the observations are in the same position within the data set. So now I re add the filter data back in, and that's the all that data back in so all your metrics with disclosure performed on your whole numbers so but just before i download it i'll remove the serial number again and uh, once that's been removed i'm just going to make a few quick checks just to see the data as, as expected so number of entries 30278 which is what i expect and i'm also going to use the summary tables in tab two as, gui as guidance for that so the variables that were processed with suppression, total patient seen and value were both originally numeric variables. And if I check the data summary after processing, you can now see that they're both character variables, which is what you'd expect for primary and secondary suppression. So once these checks have been made, I go to tab five for download data. And then uh, I just have to click the download data button. So this will uh, download the data to a download folder, you'll then have to upload a copy and paste the file to a folder of your choice. Uh, two points I want to mention here for the file is for the naming convention, the output file name is always the same as the input file name apart from one thing, and this, this is that the SDC underscore is appended to the beginning of the file name. Uh, the final point I want to raise is that the file type for the output is exactly the same as the file type for the input. And uh, that's how to use the statistical disclosure app and all the features within it. That's brilliant, Robert. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, and just to say well done to Alex and Robert for, for their work on this, because the, I say this did start off with can we get a little bit of code to, to help with suppression? Um, and it's now morphed into um, this type of app. So it's we're quite excited about it and looking forward now to rolling it out across Public Health Scotland. Um, and if anybody on the call would like to have a chat about it, um, we would be more than happy to, to pick that up with you. Thank you. Uh, well, again, thank you to, to Scott, Alex and, and Robert. Uh, what I love about this example is how uh, a very key important task that is uh, kind of a key part of our values in terms of data, especially in the, in the UK. Um, and it's quite a tricky task, actually to kind of kind of do on a regular basis. So I'm seeing it as in quotes as a productivity tool for analysts, really. Is that how it's being pitched and perceived for, by your team? Yeah, I think that's probably right. I and mean, we've spoken to a few teams about this um, and there's certainly teams within our organisation that have huge, huge data sets and they're doing this stuff manually. So for to put it, it, it for them to run their data through this app, it saves a huge amount of time um, and takes away any human error. So yeah, it's definitely um, good for productivity in terms of e easing up some capacity. Well, one of the one of the barriers to uh, developing analysts for them to kind of have learning time, play time, 
is lack of lack of time really from 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 repeated tasks and automation of those repeated tasks i think is actually a, a key a key thing um so so um we, we, there is a question that I'll pick it up just now, but do you propose to share the co your code on GitHub for for this? Yeah, I think so. We're, we're quite happy to share scripts. Um, so it, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get this onto GitHub um, and people can use it. Um, Alex, does that sound OK? Any, any problems with that? Uh, not at all. We're, we're actually also developing a little technical presentation because we are kind of, uh, we're aware that though it's for statistical disclosure control what we've done using the app in this way might be really helpful for other people and other right. and other kind of repeat jobs that they do so producing a little technical presentation that can support how everything's structured the different scripts that go together and how and where they're called and we also think it would be quite a good kind of legacy of this project for other people to do other things with so yeah absolutely to share okay I've got a, a comment. It's anonymous, but I, I will read it because I think it's well. First of all, it it, it makes it obviously recognises that this is a very important um, piece of kind of infrastructure that's been developed. But the question is along, or the thought is that uploading sensitive data to website could be problematic if I accidentally uploaded it to the wrong website, and then that website kept hold of the data. So and then it goes on to say that uh, we should be careful to avoid a private app claiming to do this job. So can you speak, please speak to how we might ensure that we only upload our data to a trustworthy dashboard? Uh, do we ensure that we only have a local copy of the dashboard or any, any thoughts on that really? Yeah, it's, it's been something that we've been thinking about um, particularly in the governance of this. So first of all, there's nothing ever stored on on this app um, so once you load your data up you, you do your stuff download it back out if you come out of the app at any point, the, 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 when you've seen the way it happened with robert when his connection lost his data, his data all went with him um so it, it's nothing there's nothing stored there that MD can hack into um to make sure we've got it onto the correct version of the of the website we have uploaded this to the scotland r server um or r shiny server um so there's only ever basically one link that will be used to that and if we make any changes to the code in the background it will automatically be updated so um if you're not using the the physical link that that you would get from us then there's no other alternative really unless somebody else has developed something but um so what i'm trying to say is in terms of version control it's always going to be the most up-to-date one and all previous versions will disappear as soon as we make a um, an update I hope that answers the question. Yeah, so, it's, it's, so, so, so you've got a dedicated uh, R, R server, uh, and I think uh, the um, the basic kind of requirement for uh, a statistical disclosure, uh, first I call it suppression, uh, is uh, is uh, universal in the UK, uh, mm. and so finding a way to um, to kind of make the make the uh, the uh, the app that you've developed work in different jurisdictions is going to be important and, and learning how you've done that I think will also be part of that part of that process really. Just to, just to add to that is the app can be run in several. You've gone on to mute Alex. Please, Alex. Sorry I just hit my mouse and mute myself sorry. Uh, the, the app can be used and run in, in a couple of ways so we've got it hosted on our, our, our shiny server internally so it's good for us but for people that don't have that uh, capability within their organization it can be run from code so they could run it locally in that way say from a downloaded version of from github or something so there is different ways to access it if you have a, a our shiny app uh, sorry server in your organization then you could host it in that safe and secure manner so it wouldn't be external external to 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 be used if that right. makes sense yeah yeah alex that's right already we've had a comment to say that sounds great actually uh, uh somebody says i have some co co complicated code to do by disclosure so so being able to um so so look that's absolutely uh, look i'm i'm buzzing with delight about what i've seen because because this is um kind of the spirit of open source really uh kind of organically working to to, to address problems that the community faces and is able to share their progress, uh, uh, their kind of learning with so many others who've got similar headaches to to address really. So um, 
so that's been uh, that's been great. I'll just I'll just wait to, to see if there's any more questions, and perhaps if there's any things across uh, the three of Alex or Robert or Scott, any of the things you want to highlight or any of the points you want to make, just while we're waiting for any other questions or comments. Uh, can I, I just want to raise uh, one quick point about the code here? So if you were to run it uh, by code, though, I just just want to say that you don't need any real understanding of the code to actually run the app itself. So if you were to ever do that, there's always a section saying called run app, which will run all the code for you. No understanding of ours uh, required. Great. I actually also really like the uh, the flowchart that you've you, you first introduced and how it kind of is aimed at essentially even uh, kind of people who are not uh, coders uh, or analysts but but have a data table in front of them that they have to send maybe to the media or something so the use cases i think are many really and one of the things i'd like to try and um keep an eye on is kind of just uh, who this app starts to infect and and what they do with it really so little stories of how people are using it and it would be nice to kind of find a way to collate that in some way um so that would be the other the other kind of uh, have you got uh, just while we're kind of winding down, Scott? Th this is great, by the way. Public Health Scotland have been have kind of taken embraced R in in a really big way. And um, do you have other things that that you want to kind of? I'm not I'm not kind of asking any progress reports, but what other things are you guys working on where where kind of this sort of open source approach is a key part of your thinking? I think the the biggest thing that's happening across the organisation in terms of our work is is currently dashboards. Um, mm -hmm. So we've had lots of kind of dashboards appear over the last last little while. Um, a couple of different COVID ones as well. However, there's going to be a bit of work um, over the next few months to try and not necessarily standardise them, but but make these make these dashboards as as, as useful as possible. Um, so we're going to try and move away from big long PDF reports and give people data using dashboards, but also try to make sure that we don't lose any of the intelligence at the same time. So we don't want to just give people numbers. We need to say what the numbers are about. Um, so it's probably the development of dashboards is, is, there, is a sort of number one thing on our at the moment. Um, and is that uh, mostly using Shiny or uh, as your kind of key dashboard uh, toolbox? Yep, um, we, we tend to use our Shiny because we like the, um, the way we can play around with it, particularly for um, accessibility purposes. Um, there's always a bit of a debate, particularly in public health Scotland, but it doesn't seem to happen anywhere else that Tableau dashboards are not particularly accessible and don't meet the criteria. Um, I don't know the technical the technicalities of that, but apparently our, our Shiny is much more um, accessible friendly. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so it's mostly our Shiny up here. Great. Uh, Alex and Robert, just so any personal reflections? Perhaps I'll start with Alex and then Robert. Just your personal reflections on, on your involvement with this kind of, you know, kind of how you felt about it. Did you enjoy it? Are you kind of looking for more stuff like this or just your personal reflections, how it felt? It, it, it felt, uh, well, we kept thinking about it and looking at it from what would happen if you weren't really good at either. and. And that kept chasing us, well, not chasing us, pushing us along to to come up with the app. And then since the app, we've had a good think about what we can do, particularly in terms of our own work within the Chile team of how we can integrate an app to do data linkage using the Chi number. Um, we think we can, again, it's a lot of R and we've managed to standardise a lot of our scripts going forward. But again, it's something we could actually do through an app that would allow people not to have a good basis of R to then use. They can actually just go in and have an understanding of data linkage of Kai. And we're thinking that's probably where we're going to try and take this methodology and use going forward. And also maybe stuff around UPRN and possibly where you can do some data linkage with that kind of thing is where we're going to go with this, this kind of idea going forward. So. Okay. to make it easier for people to access to access, access these types of processes that they might not be able to do because they don't have the direct programming skills. Great, thank you Alex. And uh, Robert, any personal reflections from you please? Uh, oh yeah, so I mean I'd say my personal reflections are very similar uh, overall to Alex. So I think uh, for the shite of using Shiny, though, I think it's uh, very useful for someone that's maybe not got uh, as much experience in R. 
so don't have to understand any code. And also think another advantage of Shiny, especially with this app today, is you can visually see some of the changes that are made, which are a lot quicker than you could with code. And I certainly think for like some of the jobs like we do in the Chile team, like Alex just mentioned with CHI numbers, UPRNs, I'd say, certainly I think it'd be very good though to use the app so you can uh, make some of the visual changes. You can see it right away. You don't need to have uh, any prior understanding of code at all. So I certainly think it's going to be used in the future for a few of the projects that we do in the team. That's great. I wish there was a way to track it. If it was a, I mean, a, you know, a CRAN package can be tracked in terms of downloads and we have a sense of how often it's used. Maybe you can think about a way to track how often this is being used and I'd love to see it kind of uh, cascade across the different parts of the of the UK. So I'll, I'll bring the discussion to a close. A big thank you to all of you for, really for an amazing piece of work, which uh, which I think um, will will uh, will find its way uh, to a lot of a lot of um, uh, summary tables that people want to want to publish really. Um, and so I'll just turn to the audience and just say again, thank you also for, for, for giving time and joining the community. The community only is vibrant because of this uh, interaction and the voluntary time that everybody gives really. Uh, the, the, the screen just shows you some of the highlights that are coming. Probably the big thing is the conference on the 16th and 17th of November. Um, there's an app called for abstracts. If you look at our Twitter handle or go onto our website, you'll see the details. If you can't find them, just email us. And likewise, we're always looking for the community to speak about work that they've done through webinars and through and ad, and kind of promote through blogs and so on. So uh, you know, the NHS is one of the world's largest employers, and and we all, we ought to be able to kind of uh, field. Uh, just as we have done today, it's really good pieces of work done by people who are in the in the kind of uh, in the heart of data science related issues that are facing the NHS. So uh, I'm sure there's lots of interesting work happening in lots of different places. So so don't feel shy and, and do come forward, please. And a big thank you to our colleagues from Scotland uh, uh, for uh, for sharing this piece of work. And I hope we'll see more more about it uh, in the future. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Charlotte, as well, for keeping us on time and organising us for behind the scenes. Thanks, everybody. Have a really good afternoon.